So now we're going to shift gears and we're going to move to the early to mid 19th century, the War of 1812 era and the Mexican-American War era. What you're going to notice during these demonstrations is that the weapons are very similar, flintlock muskets. What's changed are the uniforms. And to share with you more about these two eras, we've invited a ranger from Fort Necessity National Battlefield, Friendship Hill National Historic Site up in Pennsylvania, to share with you about the Gallatin musket invented by Albert Gallatin, who owned Friendship Hill. Our second demonstration, the Mexican-American War era, we invited a ranger from Fort Smith National Historic Site in Arkansas. Take it away, gentlemen. And so Living historian, is one wearing that gray, they would have worn standing on campaign, in a field not with trees the behind uniform by the U.S. Army. We'll talk a little bit about the musket. The main weapon used by the U.S. Army in the War of 1812 was the Model 1795 Springfield. And the reason we have it out today is that's an exact, exact copy, basically, uh, is what the Gallatin musket is. It's a contract musket produced to copy the Model 1795 Springfield, the first musket produced for the United States Army uh, at Springfield Armory. So this is a smooth bore flintlock musket. Uh, what do those things mean when we say them? Well, smooth bore simply means that the barrel here is no grooves or rifling cut into it. It's completely smooth on the inside. So what would be the difference between a smooth bore and a rifle? Most of you probably already know this, but rifling or those grooves cut on the inside of the barrel provide more accuracy to the projectile as it comes out. It makes the projectile spin as it goes down the barrel. The, bu the bullet basically fits into those grooves and spins, uh, much like a quarterback throwing a spiral in a football game. When we all watch our favorite teams out there. We don't want to see the quarterback sort of throw a lame duck up. We want to see him throw that nice, tight, accurate spiral down the field. And that's what rifling would do. It would provide a much greater accuracy to this weapon. So this weapon doesn't have that. Uh, it is smooth bore, and that means that the bullet doesn't really fit into the barrel. It kind of bounces down the barrel on the way out. So when you fire it down here, the ball will basically start bouncing. The last place it bounces before it leaves the barrel is the way that the bullet's going to go. So it's really not a very accurate weapon. The accurate range on this weapon is about 60 to 80 yards. So we're in the early 19th century here, but it wouldn't be much different than the accuracy of the weapons used here at the Battle of Fort Necessity you know, many years earlier. So an inaccurate weapon, the ammunition itself also makes it inaccurate. So because this weapon uses black powder, and black powder is very corrosive, every time you fire it, it builds up in the barrel, you can't really use the same size ball as the barrel, because if you did, you would have to clean the weapon after only several firings. So the bullets were generally a little bit smaller than the bore. And that also lends to that inaccuracy. As the weapon is fired, uh, that bolt bouncing down the barrel of a much smaller round and without the rifling lends itself to that inaccuracy as well. The mechanism to fire this weapon, as we mentioned, is called a flint lock. Uh, this is the lock right here on the weapon. Um, and in the lock, the firing mechanism is this piece called the cock that I'm touching right here. It's called a cock because it looks like a rooster's head, and in the cock is held a rock or a piece of flint, hence the flintlock weapon. The way this weapon works is when you pull the trigger, this piece of stone or flint is going to come flying forward and strike steel. We all know what happens when flint strikes steel, sparks are created. And so you can see those sparks right there would fall down into a small pan on the side of the weapon. And that's where we would have put initially that powder, that would have the priming powder in this pan. The sparks fall down into the pan. They go through a small hole in the side of the barrel called the vent or touch hole. And that's what ignites the main charge that we would have loaded down the barrel. Again, so a flintlock, smooth bore weapon. And I'm basically going to walk you through exactly how this weapon is loaded and fired. We're not going to use any drill manuals or anything like that. We're basically just going to walk through the steps so you can see exactly how the weapon is fired. So the first thing the soldier would have done after he had fired the weapon is he would have reached into his cartridge box, pulled out a pre-made paper cartridge. So unlike we may have seen in the Hollywood movies, uh, soldiers in the 18th and early 19th century, generally professional soldiers were not running around on the battlefield with powder horns loading as they went. They had pre-formed ammunition that would have been made ahead of time and it would have been all packed into one nice tight little component here. So we have a paper cartridge at the bottom of which would have been a musket ball uh, this is a 69 caliber weapon, so probably about a 64 caliber ball. A pre-measured amount of powder. So those of you familiar with modern metallic ammunition, this is its basically 18th and early 19th century ancestor. The way this cartridge was opened, since I have both my hands full, 
was to tear it open with the teeth. So we would bite the cartridge open. We would then pour a small amount of powder into that pan to prime the weapon. The pan would then be shut, and we turn the weapon around to introduce the main charge into the barrel. So the rest of the gunpowder, and then the paper in, with the musket ball if we had one. We would then take out our ramrod, and we're going to seat that cartridge all the way at the base of the barrel, basically lining up the main cartridge with the touch hole or vent. We then return our ramrod. We don't want to lose that guy or fire it away. It's kind of difficult to load your weapon if you leave it in the barrel. The weapon is then ready to fire. So most soldiers uh, in the 18th and 19th century could do what I just did there about three times a minute or once every 20 seconds or so. So the weapon is now ready to fire and we'll attempt to fire the weapon again. The weapon is brought up, it's brought to full cock, the hammer stall is taken off, the weapon is leveled and we attempt to fire. My name is Cody Favor. I'm a park ranger here at Fort Smith National Historic Site. Thank you for joining us today. I'm out here at the first fort site overlooking the Arkansas and the Poto Rivers. If you were to look behind me, you can see the river. It's a beautiful sunny day out here today. The grass is all green. There's hardly a, a cloud in the sky. In fact, it kind of matches the cool uniform that I've got on, which is a, a Mexican War era uniform. Uh, we'll talk about that here in just a second, and we'll get to our, our cool 1777 model of Charlieville. But why this? Why are we talking about some of this as following Fort Smith? How does Fort Smith fit into the National Park story? Well, we actually start in 1817 where the Osage and the Cherokee began fighting and so the U.S. military comes out to settle that peace between them for the most part. They stay here from 1817 to 1824. It's the military. In 1830s, they come back to build the second Fort Smith because in 1830 you have the Indian Removal Act under President Andrew Jackson. As that begins the force removal of the tribes, many of them begin coming to this area and the, and the locals are afraid there's going to be problems, so they end up building a second Fort Smith, which is much larger than the first Fort Smith, and, and for they, actually the military stays here all the way through 1872. But as they're continuing to build, of course, the country is continuing to grow, and so by the mid-1840s, the war is about to start raging uh, with the War of Mexico, and 1846 to 48, that takes place. And that's where you'd see guys like me standing up in this awesome uniform. Luckily, it's not very hot out here today, so I'm not burning up. But it is a pretty warm wool uniform. It's, again, the color of the sky, this blue uniform. Uh, but it's, it's very nice. And I know you're jealous of this awesome hat that I've got on. I know it doesn't make me a post officer. It actually just makes me a soldier. This is the hat they used at the time called a wheel hat. It's probably the most common name that they used. Uh, and again, this white buff leather that I've got my all the my cool stuff. I'll go over here in just a second. But Fort Smith played a part in the Mexican War uh, as they sent thousands of troops through here. They would get here, they would join or enlist, or they would train, and they'd go down to Texas and possibly join like the incursion, say, under Zachary Taylor as they go into the northern part of Mexico. And that's something you can get to study about at a later date. But this is something that they actually would have carried, again, how they would have looked. This is 1777 Charlottesville. This is a flintlock musket. Um, very common. This is a French style musket. It even sounds like that for Charleville. It has a great name, uh, but this actually saw service from in the U.S. military from the Revolutionary War all the way up into about the time period that I'm doing right here. And so it's a very basic gun. I'm sure you're going to watch other videos that's going to talk about some of this, but just in case you missed them, let's, let's go over the, just the basic workings of this firearm. So again, this is a flintlock musket. There's three main parts to this weapon. There's the lock, which is right here. This is your ignition system, trigger, all that fun stuff. Your stock, which is the wooden part right here that I hold on to, and it keeps everything together. And of course, your barrel. And so that's where, we'll, again, we'll get to that here in just a second as we talk about the different parts. But let's talk about the lock and how this starts. So here's some of my equipment. I have my cartridge box. I would keep my, say, my rounds that I loaded inside of here. And that's actually what I would be digging out to get my powder and stuff. If I can get one out there. There we go. And I tear that off. You gotta have teeth since you're in the military. And we put it inside this small little pan. Now you can kind of see that little pan right here. It will look like a little trough, piece of metal. And I'd pour this gunpowder. It's black, it's uh, potassium nitrate, sulfur, and charcoal in the proper proportions. And we'd put that down inside that little pan right there. You can kind of see there's a little hole drilled into that piece of metal right there, our barrel. And once this goes off, you can see this cool little piece of flint right here. That flint would fly forward hit this hammer right here, 
we want to cover that up. We make sure our powder doesn't fall out and it doesn't get wet, right? So that would fly forward. It would actually cut off hot pieces of metal and shower all that black powder with all those hot pieces of metal. Well, of course, what's going to happen? Boom, the gun's going to go off. It's going to set that off, cause a huge explosion right here, right next to your face when you're aiming it, actually. Good times. Uh, and that's going to set off your main charge. So now after I've poured that, before I pull the trigger and everything else, I would take the remainder of that and I'd pour it down the end of my barrel. I would then take my, the ball would go down inside that too. We're just firing a blank around today. I take out my ramrod, which is this long piece of shiny metal here, and I would actually beat that ball to the bottom. Now, a good fast soldier could possibly do this maybe three times a minute, and that's under no duress, no one's shooting back at him and so forth. Uh, but it, let's say that he was that good, okay, three times a minute. But really the reason they could do that is this barrel, this long shiny piece of barrel is just as smooth on the inside as it is on the outside. And why that's important is that ball, I want to fit in there very loosely because I want to load it as quick as possible. Uh, if you see in the movies, the soldiers, big giant lines lining up against, uh, over big giant fields, they're firing each other with weapons like this because they want to fire as fast as possible. So I'm not as concerned with accuracy. Many people thought that accuracy wasn't as important at the time because after all, after a, a few rounds by each side, you're not going to be able to see much anyways. So they said. So, again, I want to fire big, large volleys, many of these as I can, as fast as I can. And so, again, accuracy is not important. So when I put that ball down inside, remember, set off my main ignition charge right here. That's going to fly forward, set off my ignition set off the main charge, propel that ball out of there, turn that solid into a gas, and propel that down the barrel here. Now, remember, it's loose, and so it's literally bouncing inside the barrel as it goes along, just a little bit. So the last place it hits is really the direction it goes in. Accuracy on this is maybe 50 to 100 yards at a man-sized target, so not that great. Uh, but at the same time, again, I want to be very fast. And at this time, uh, say the American soldiers fighting a large group of uh, Mexicans in the Mexican-American War, Again, both sides are smoothbore. Now, this is a 69 caliber ball that would have been used, 0.69 inches across. That's large. You don't get nicked with something that big. That's really going to put the hurt on somebody. And again, they wanted to be close to the enemy they were fighting, which was the Brown Best weapon, uh, which is a British gun. And it would have actually fired a 75 caliber ball, even bigger. So they wanted something big. They wanted to cut out a little bit of weight. So they made 69 caliber. Uh, again, still a hefty ball and a round to send down range. Now, all this weapon all told, again, fire it's not very fast it's not super dependable either again what if this gets wet what if it gets damp and so forth now i'm going to shoot this here in just a second if it doesn't go off that's okay uh because that's pretty historically accurate actually so let's see if this works so let me take my my cartridge out of here share this with my teeth i'm going to put a little bit inside my pan right here not a whole awful lot i'm going to cover that back up um, again, I don't want this to fall out. I don't want it to get wet. And this is actually a half charge, so believe it or not, I'm actually going to do this twice. I know that sounds kind of odd, but the rounds that I made weren't quite enough. See if I can get that over there. there we go. Got it that time. All right. Pour that down inside. And use that paper kind of as a pad. Again, we're just loading blank rounds on a live round beat this down to the bottom. Now again, I'm I'm clear here, there's no one outside my little area. Always got to put your ramrod back, otherwise you have a really cool spear, but you'll never be able to fire your weapon ever again, which is no good. So let's see if this, let me see if I can mark this off where you can see me. All right, we ready? Let's try this. Oh, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? Mmm, smell that sulfur burning, that's great. So again, really simple. Uh, but as you guys watch the other videos, you're going to see a progression of these weapons go on. There's a reason, though, that they carry things like bayonets, because after that one shot, typically this is going to turn to a big spear. I'm going to lock that on the end and, and keep on fighting. So again, real simple, guys. Thank you so much for joining us here at Force of National Stork Site. Come see me sometime. Uh, and have a great day.